Hi everyone, sorry about that. I was trying to get my new, if you were here last went Friday, you probably knew about all the tech issues I was having with PowerPoint. So I was trying to trouble, troubleshoot and see if I could get something better working in the meantime. All right, so let's see, set the slideshow here. And slideshow, set slideshow. Okay, here we go. All right, so we're continuing with muscle tissue, and the thing is that will I have all time to cover everything about muscle tissue? Probably not, even though I would love to cover a lot more about muscle tissue, but I'll try my best to get through what I have planned for everyone today. Oh, oh, nope, that's wrong. Oof. Let's see, what was that? Command click. Ah, here we go. I know. Hi, how was everyone's weekend? <laughs> okay. All right, now we're back on the right track. Okay. All right. Okay, let's go back to things. Okay, so we're going to try to cover the rest of the And when do I post the study guide? Again, it's always like one week before the exam. That's when I post it. Okay. And let's go with that. But again, the study guide is pretty much just a rehash and just a s outline of everything we covered in the lecture and some of the things from the homework as well. But again, if you're being taking your own notes and be doing your own outlines of the lectures, you probably notice that it's very similar to the study guide. So that's pretty much what you should be doing if you're trying to make it. And I mean, the best study guide is the one you create yourself because the one, if you use someone else's study guide, I mean, when they're filling it out, and they're putting in all the details. Who's actually doing processing the information, determining what's relevant to the topic or what's not? So this is why if you do your own study guides, it pays off more because you're actually digesting the material rather than just someone just presenting it and then you're like, oh, okay, all the details are here. This is my study guide. I'm just gonna review it. Because this is a common misconception. Reviewing is not the same thing as learning. Learning is taking information and encoding it in your brain so you can use it later. Okay, so then last week Friday, we covered the neuromuscular junction, so all this sequence of events. And if you notice, I cut out that pretty disastrous PowerPoint drawing out from the last one. And I linked in that same video in the description to one I did last year, which is a lot better than the one I did um, this year. But this is the cartoon. Again, what are action potentials? At this point, just know that there's movement of ions, this electrochemical activity. And when the action potentials reach the axon terminals of a motor neuron, this triggers an influx of calcium. That triggers the release of neurotransmitters, and these neurotransmitters are at the neuromuscular junction. It's acetylcholine. And acetylcholine binds to these receptors that are between the neuron and the skeletal muscle. And this acetylcholine, then when it binds that receptors, it opens these, this, these are combination receptors and ion channels. So when these cha ion channels open due to binding acetylcholine, this triggers a wave of action potentials in, along the skeletal muscle fiber. And this causes the, this electrical activity, it opens these, like, ch these calcium channels on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And one of the key functions of the sarcoplasmic reticulum is that it stores all this calcium when a cell is at, or skeletal muscle is at rest. So when you open these calcium channels due to action potentials, this releases a bunch of calcium into the cytoplasm of a muscle cell. That's where we left off last week. Now, here's the thing. What about all this calcium? Is it just like, okay, they're flooding the cell with calcium for kicks. Now we get to this part. And what we're looking at are those thick and thin filaments we talked about earlier. And remember, those thick filaments that are mostly made up of myosin, they pull the actin, they pull these thin filaments. So they pull the actin, which makes up most of the thin filaments. Notice that there are other proteins as well, but actin makes up the majority of it. So once you have calcium in this situation, now myosin and actin can bind. So again, normally during contraction, myosin binds to actin and pulls it. But this blue green thing right here, this is something called tropomyosin. And we don't have calcium in the equation. Tropomyosin actually blocks myosin from grabbing onto what we call the active sites of actin. So if you have tropomyosin blocking the, what we call active sites on actin, 
then myosin can't bind. Therefore, if myosin can't actually grab a hold of the actin, it can't pull and you don't have contraction. So I like to draw this analogy. So I think of this like tropomyosin is like the velvet rope and actin is where the myosin wants to get at. So what happens is that here's troponin and troponin is, are these small proteins over here. And if you're going to medicine, this is actually an important protein to know because especially for cardiac and cardiology, that's some pro protein, protein we test for to see if someone's having heart issues. So what we have here is that tropomyosin is like that green rope right? see, we see over here that's blocking actin and troponin is like the little bouncer. So what do you have to do to get past tropomyosin? What do you have to do to get past this little barrier? Well, you have to pay off the bouncer, right? So you have to pay them with something. And in this case, troponin, what do you have to pay off troponin with? You have to give them calcium. So if you give tropionin calcium, what happens is that troponin will take tropomyosin, and this is why you see it linked right here. So troponin will take tropomyosin and move it away. And when it moves away, now that we have myosin, can now bind to the active sites of actin, and now myosin can finally grab onto actin and pull it. So this is what troponin is. It's kind of a, it's a regulator because if it doesn't have calcium, then it's this tropomyosin is going to block the binding of actin and myosin, thereby causing relaxation. But if you give troponin calcium, it's going to move away tropomyosin, and now you can have contraction because now you can have myosin binding to actin. Okay. So again, troponin is that little blob we see here. Actually, it's a complex of proteins, but for this class, you should know it's just a, it is a protein, and its main purpose is to move troponin, I mean, tropomyosin away from actin. So troponin moves tropomyosin away from actin, and now myosin can bind to actin again and pull actin. So this is why you need that flood of calcium with all those sequence of events we had at the neuromuscular junction. If you don't have calcium, what's going to happen? Well, that tropomyosin stays in place. You can't get actin and myosin binding. And this is why it's important. So this myosin, this is not only a filament, but has these heads, and these are what actually grab onto actin. And I like to think of myosin heads like the heads of a paddle. So pretend like this big kayak or canoe here is a big myosin filament, and these little heads are little paddles. So I like to draw like, it's not just like tug of war, it's also kind of like doing, doing a paddling. And what we have here, and remember, myosin, those are the thick filaments, and when you see some paddlers, they can be thick, right? Because they're lifting weights, they're doing all the shoulder work, they're using their lats, they're using their guns. So this is why myosin, I think of them like not only just like tug of war, but also like paddlers as well. But, so yeah, it doesn't matter, <laughs> yeah, so myosin, my oh my, they are thick, right? So myosin is thick. Now, another analogy between myosin, so I like to think of the myosin head, this is actually what binds to actin. So the thing is that when somebody's rowing a kayak or canoe or paddling, they do a rhythmic, they always do this like repetitive motion, right? So they're always paddling, they have a consistent motion, and they're trying to do this over and over again. So they're able to put, generate the force to move the, the um, whichever like canoe, kayak forward. So what do you need to actually do? You actually need to plant, right? You need to plant the, the paddle into the water. I think of it this way. So what happens here is like when, with my analogy, so the myosin head is like the paddle going into the water. Like you actually need to make contact with the water to generate force, right? Same with myosin pulling actin. You actually need to have binding of myosin to actin because if you're not grabbing onto it, how are you going to move the actin? How are you going to pull it? So you need to actually plant that myosin head onto actin. So when you have this happening, this is what we call a cross bridge. So cross bridge formation refers to myosin binding to actin, just like the paddle is being inserted into the water. But this is uncle just giving a demonstration, so I'm just trying to to show you like what would happen. And then what happens is that notice that this head swivels on this part right here. So this swiveling is called a power stroke because again, to generate that force with a paddle, do you just stick it in the water and do nothing? No, that's gonna cause you to break, right? So you have to actually push it, right? So then pull, pull and put, you have to generate and move that paddle, right? 
So this is what we call a power stroke when we're talking about the smile sin head swiveling. And just like how when someone paddles and they stroke, they move the whole paddle, this generates force. So this is why we're actually able to get that force and pulling motion with this myosin and actin. Now, so think uncle's tired, he used up his energy. Now what does he do? Pretend that uncle is kind of like, okay, he's a good paddler, but he needs to refuel quite often because like he's not as youthful as he used to be. So what does he need? He needs energy. He needs to refuel. So I like to think of it this way. To refuel, he needs energy, and his energy drink of choice is ATP. And same with the uh, myosin and actin. So notice that during this process, when you had this power stroke and this, that we have this ADP and inorganic phosphate. But in order to actually reset again, you need ATP. So ATP actually pretend he's like catches that ATP can on his paddle. And this allows it to the myosin to actually detach from actin because so this is an important step because if you didn't have that the myosin would be still stuck to actin so this is how he's able to recharge and then remember atp has energy right so energy is contained within the bonds of atp especially between the second and third bond this is where you find a lot of energy so with this energy uncle gets energized again so does the myosin head. So the myosin head is able to go back to its original location and then you can start the whole cycle again. So what happens, again, you have to form that cross bridge. Uncle has to put the paddle in the water and then he has to move the paddle just like we have this power stroke. And then what happens to, to take it off the actin and get the paddle out of the water, he needs additional energy and this is where ATP comes in. So we can have detachment, and we can start the whole cycle all over again. So this is how what we call the contraction cycle. So again, the contraction cycle, we need the previous events of the neuromuscular junction. Otherwise, how are you going to get the calcium? How are you going to get myosin and actin binding? But now we're getting the actual contraction and movement and sliding of actin and myosin across each other. Now. This is a uh, shortening during a contraction. Yes, yes. So the things that do are your muscles are like this. Well, if you take a cross section and just cause them to contract, yeah. But most of your muscles, they're attached to something. So this is why it's important to have all those bones and those like the bones uh, and bone markings. So your muscles have something to attach to and have are able to move things around in your skeleton. Now, sarcomeric shortening. So. Now we know that, okay, myosin pulls actin, and this causes muscles to contract. Now, what is the sarcomeric shortening? What's well, referring to, here we have all these, the actin over here, and here we have these thick filaments that contain myosin. So remember, the myosin is going to pull this actin, and as it pulls actin, and this is, even though I'm showing you like a, a sort of asynchronous way, what you notice over time, if you have myosin continuing to pull actin, it's going to pull everything together. So what we saw is the distance between these actin molecules. As myosin continued to pull them, they start to get smaller and smaller. So the whole cell would start to shrink because of all these actin filament and myosin filaments shortening and drawing themselves towards each other. So this is what we call sarcomeric shortening. Now myosin and actin, again, remember myosin, my oh my, they are thick, and actins, if the actors are thin. Now, this is what a sarcomere is. And if you might be like, oh my god, what is all of this? This looks like a whole bunch of stuff, and I'm going to walk you through it. And this is when, I, got, I remember like when I first saw this, I'm like, A band, I band, Z line, H, it's all this alphabet soup. And I wish it could have come up with mnemonics, and it's really hard to come up with mnemonics because actually these are based on German words. And I don't expect you to know the German because like, well, maybe if you're going to business, German might be useful, but you're already dealing with a lot of Latin and Greek terms. And this is where we have, so you might be like, okay, where, where exactly are these bands? And how do I know where they are in this sarcomere? Because this structure repeats over and over along a myrofibril, so it's kind of important to know where they are. So what, here's the, that was the OpenStax version, and here's the Martini version. 
And what we see is if you take a cross section of a myofibril, and this is using something we call electron microscope. So you're actually looking in the micro at the microscopic and not microscope, but the atomic level and molecular level when you're doing this electron microscope. So you can see it has this kind of striated pattern, and this corresponds to the different parts like the active thick filaments, the thin filaments, and there are, are more proteins like titan, but for this class, I want you to focus on the actin and my myosin. Okay, so hopefully this works out because I'm going to try to use my desktop. I'm still trying to find my pencil from for my um, other pad, but until I find it then, then I'm going to use computer. So hopefully this works out well. If you have your favorite um, favorite drawing tools, by all means, take it out right now, and I'll walk you through and how to draw the sarcomere. So basically, what I want you especially to have are two colors that will help you. You can't have more than two colors, but I mean, or one color, but it's going to be hard to tell between the thick and thin filaments. All right, so for the thin filaments, I'm going to use red, and different textbooks, sometimes they use the thick filaments, filaments as red thin filaments as blue. For me, I'll use the thin filaments as red. So, thin. At least I'm not getting the random horizontal lines. That horizontal line's on purpose. And let's make this blue one a thick filament. Well, oh, that might be too thick. Yeah, thick. Okay, so what we're going to draw are, we're first going to draw the Z lines, and I like to draw the Z lines. Now, this isn't completely accurate, but I like to draw the Z lines as little zigzags. So I'd like to do this. And why? Because zigzag starts with Z, and I like to think of it as like, it's kind of like I'm drawing the letter Z over and over and over again. So this is Z line one. And I'm going to draw another Z line here. So Z lines are what you call the borders of something we call a sarcomere. And this is what shortens during contraction. So this part right here, between each Z lines you have the sarcomere. Now, I don't want you to write this on your, if you're taking the lab, I want you to write this on this lab practical because they'll mark it wrong and it is wrong. But I like to think in my head when I'm thinking like, okay, Z-line sarcomere, Z-line sarcomere. So I like to think of it in my head as like I'm saying it with an accent and I'm saying sarcomere. So I like to think of it like that. Or you can think of these like little S's over here too. So what we have here are between the Z-lines, we have a sarcomere. Now, in the very middle, and this is probably the only German <laughs> word that's pretty e easy and useful. Like middle, the German word for middle is the same, but it's spelled with T's instead of D's. So what we have here is the M line. So the M line right in the middle. So that's probably the easiest one to identify in a sarcomere. So the M line anchors all of these my thick filaments, these myosin filaments. So you can also think is like M line is the mid in the middle of all the myosin. So the M line anchors all the thick filaments with all the little heads. So we're drawing all these thick filaments. And you can draw well we don't have time to draw all the heads on the thick filaments, but let's draw some thick filament heads here. I'm getting lazy here. Okay, so remember that the myosin grabs onto what? It has to grab onto actin, right? So we draw all the actin filaments that the thick filaments would draw, grab onto. I 
Actually, I wish I drew more overlap between these. Okay, so we have our M line, we have our Z lines, and there's something, and actually maybe let me extend these A actin filaments a little more because what I'm going to try to draw next is something we call the H zone. And the H zone, this is another German word. It's like, it's actually Hella, but I mean, don't worry about that. It just means lighter or brighter in German. But the, where is the H zone? So the H zone is actually this part right here. So if you're using a pad, what I like to do is like, when I used to do this in person, it was easier when you had a piece of paper. So if you have a piece of paper or a tablet that has like lock enabled, get your piece of paper and turn it. And why am I going to ask you to turn it 30 degrees? Because when you draw H's here, I like to think of this way. So where I'm drawing these H's are between the border where the limits of these little H's are. So I'm drawing H here, an H here, an H here, another H here. And the border between that is... So you don't want these H's to overlap with the actin and the thin filaments. So that's where we have that border. Even though my border isn't very clear on that left side right here. So yeah, right where these actin and thin filaments end, that's where our H zone is. So I like to think of it this way. Our H zone, sometimes it's called the H band as well, but the H part is pretty consistent. So I like to think of it, okay, I'm drawing an H here. I'm drawing an H here. Although if you're seeing it like this way, it looks like a more like a thick I, but if you draw turn it 90 degrees, it looks like an H. So this is our H zone. And my mnemonic for that is that it's like the heavy only zone. Why is it the heavy only zone? Because you only have thick filaments there. You don't have any thick filaments. Now, back to our actin. So there's another part of it called an I band. So the I band is where there's only actin. Now we're only seeing half of a sarcomere at this point. But if we looked at the other side, we would have more actin filaments. And let me just like cleave them all so they're kind of let's see just large eraser. Let's trim them all. So yeah, you would have the actin filaments, and you have the boundaries of another sarcomere over here. And so thick filaments there. So what we have between it, now the boundaries of this, what we call an I band, is actually, so there shouldn't be any thick filaments in this I band. And here we have, of, have half of another I band. Like if I drew the other sarcomere, but for time's sake, I'm not going to draw it. That would also be part of the I band. And what do you notice in the I band? There are only thin filaments. So I like to think of it the I band, it has only thin filaments. They're so thin, it's almost invisible. And we, when we look at the electron microscopy picture of it, it does look lighter. It looks like it's compared to the rest of the image. It looks like there's not, like barely anything there. It looks like a, almost like it's blank. Now, between each I bands, we have something that doesn't overlap with the I bands. So the border between each I band is something we call the A band. So the A band is actually between each I band. So they are mutually exclusive. A bands and I bands, they are the border of each other. 
So the way I remember it, so A band is it has both actin and myosin. I like think of it having that both actin and myosin. And there's another zone that's thankfully straightforward. So this zone right here, where they actually overlap, is called the zone of overlap. So this is where we have all the, so now you know all the lines, you know all the bands, and you know the major zones. And to review, let's go back to our presentation. So what we have here, I'm going to sh walk you through it again. So we remember all those Z lines, I like to think of them as little Z as Zs. They're zigzagging across, they anchor all the actin and thin filaments. Therefore, this is what we have with the Z lines. So these are over here. So the Z lines, in between each Z line, we have a sarcomere. And remember, I like to mispronounce it in my head because like, why? The sarcomere is between the Z lines, it's a sarcomere. So do not write sarcomere on your lab exams if you're taking the lab. You'd be warned on that. Okay, so remember this part right here where you don't have these myosin and thick filaments. So what we have here are the I bands. So look at this in the electron microscope, um, under the electron microscope. Notice that these regions right here, they're relatively lighter compared to the surround the A bands. So the actual like reason why they're called I bands is from isotropy, which is pronounced the same, almost the same in German, but isotropy refers to light scattering and you don't need to know that level at this level of, of anatomy and physiology that's more of a physics thing but this is a way I think of it this is so thin you only find thin filaments here it's so thin it's almost invisible so this is the way I remember the I band in both like talk in the cartoon version and the electron microscope version now what we have here right in the middle, so we have the M line. That's in the middle of all the myosin, middle of all the thickness. The M line is in the middle. And it yeah, anchors all the myosin and thick filaments. Now this one over here is a little trickier, so it's wider than the M line because again, it includes the M line, but it doesn't overlap with the actin. So this part, you only find myosin, you only find thick filaments. So this is why I call the H zone and even though this isn't the official term I call it the heavy zone because you only have myosin and thick filaments you do not have any actin or thin filaments and over here is what we have the with um, both myosin and some of the actin and thin filaments so I like to call it the A band and the A band is also like the complement of the I band they do not overlap I like to call it the A band because it has both actin and myosin. So I like to think of it that way. And over here, where they actually overlap, but you don't enter a myosin only zone or a thin only zone, this is the actual zone of overlap. And you have these over here in the sarcomere. So now we have know all the zones. Okay, so this is what showing in the open stacks. Now you see that the myosin is pulling the actin. And this changes the size of some of these bands. Like notice the H zone got smaller and we also have the sarcomere overall. Remember the Z bands are the borders of the sarcomere. So as actin pull or myosin pulls actin, then the Z bands get closer and this the overall distance gets shorter between them. That's why we call it sarcomeric shortening. So what changes during sarcomeric shortening? Well again the length, right? So to show it in a cartoon form. The myosin heads, if you have calcium in the equation, they're going to pull actin, and now the Z lines are going to drop, be drawn toward each other, and this is why we call it sarcomeric shortening. So, all right, so let's talk about muscle twitch and muscle tension. Now the books, both books actually go into more detail than I'll cover right here, but let's start off with the very basics. So what is twitch? Well, when you think of something twitching or think of a muscle twitch or if you had your eyes twitch, it's kind of like a little contraction, brief contraction, right? So it's a single contraction produced by one action potential. So that means, remember those electrical activities that were occurring along a muscle cell? 
Well, that refers to just one contraction produced by that action potential from neurons and consequent spread on skeletal muscle. So it's a single contraction relaxation cycle. So the thing is that not only do you have to flood the cell with calcium to allow actin myosin to contract, but you also have to let the muscles relax, right? It's because like if you don't if you don't need that movement anymore or if you don't need to engage that muscle fiber anymore, you want it to give it time off, so you cause it to relax by moving the calcium back into the environment and the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So that whole contraction, if you contra a muscle contracts, it has to relax eventually. So a twitch is a whole cycle of this contraction and relaxation. Now tension is the force resulting from the twitch. So you can think of a twitch as a single contraction and tension, the force actually being caused by that single contraction. And this is what we see with the sarcomeres and tension. So the thing is that these actin and myosin filaments, you can actually stretch out these sarcomeres to different lengths. Here we notice that the sarcomeres indicated by the Z lines, it's very short, the distance is short in this example, but in this example over here, it's very long. So here we have a long sarcomere, here we have a short sarcomere. And here's a graph showing like, okay, how long is the sarcomere? and what's the amount of force we can produce from that length of sarcomere. And notice that it's like, okay, there's a point sweet spot over here right in the middle. If the sarcomere is too short where the Z lines are very close together, you don't have much force. But as you lengthen it, it starts to generate more force. But if you start to, start to stretch it out too much, then the force drops off again. So let's talk about this right. So this is kind of the sweet spot. Your sarcomeres have a optimal length. So if you don't, if you have them too close, they don't generate much force. If they're too stretched out, they gen don't generate much force either. So back to my paddling example, think of it like paddles in the water. And over here, what happens with the sarcomeric length if it gets overstretched? I like to think of it this way. What you know, see is that remember to generate force and contraction you need myosin pulling actin. But if you zoom in on this figure right here, notice that all the myosin heads, you have some myosin heads that aren't actually able to grab onto actin. So the Z lines are so far apart that only a few of the myosin actually is bound to actin. So it was able to grab onto actin. These ones over here, they're paddling on nothing. They're paddling on, they're not able to grab onto actin. Therefore, they're not contributing to force. So I like to think of it this way. These guys were, some of them are still paddling like this guy back here and maybe like, maybe, no, not like this guy right here, but you have fewer paddles in the water. If you have fewer paddles in the water, are you going to generate as much speed? No, right? So this is why at this point where you have your sarcomere stretched out more and more, you have fewer myosin heads interacting with actin. So you have less and less power. You have less and less tension. Now at this extreme end, why does it drop to zero completely? Say you stretch a muscle so much that you don't actually have any interactions between myosin and actin. If it gets overstretched, these myosin heads can be doing trying to cycle and do contraction cycles and doing their trying to form cross bridges but not actually being able to. They can power stroke all they want, but if they have nothing to grab onto, they can't generate force. So this is like having a beach canoe and you don't have you have paddles and you're paddling nothing but air. Same with these overstretched myosin sarcomeres. The myosin heads aren't able to bind to actin. Now on the opposite end, what if your sarcomeres are too short? So again, here we have the sweet spot here in the middle. But if you have shorter distance, I like what you notice is that okay, we have all our paddles in the water. But there is a limit to where we have our actin. So notice that the actin is almost completely contracted. So you can't contract anymore because the actin has, is already kind of ramming into the M line right here. So I like to think of it, you have all your paddles in the water, but now you have a wall here. And this may be like a few feet away. So this guy's they're all paddling at the same time. They're trying to generate the maximum force you have maxim maximum binding of actin and myosin, but if there's only a very short distance, then you just go boom. So you generate force, but not as much force. Or is it easier to generate more force from a punch from one inch away 
or if you're trying to like have the whole distance of it, like as much room as you can and generate punch that way. So this is why if it's too short, yeah, you have more actin and myosin binding, but you need distance and a change of distance to generate that force. Oops, um, ooh, boom. And everyone gets uh, and if you're already stuck here, like over at this minimal sarcomeric length, they can't move at all. So it's like trying to pal against a brick wall with uh, with your foot. Yeah, so or if you're Bruce Lee, it doesn't matter. Yeah, for real. Yeah, maybe if you're not Bruce Lee and you're just a mere mortal. But what we have here in this very extreme example, this canoe is already touching the wall. They're paddling as much as they can, but are they actually generating any movement? No, they're stuck against this wall. Okay, so types of contraction. So there's isotonic and concentric. So isotonic actually has like two types of contraction. So you can change the length of muscle and you can generate force by changing the length. So it's you're moving the muscle, right? But concentric and eccentric. So in this case, isotonic refers to any sort of like force generated by the muscle either lengthening or contracting. So in concentric contraction, the muscle shorten, and this is what we typically think of when we contract the muscle. But it is possible to contract your muscles and, and, and cause contraction, but have the muscles lengthen. So this is what we call eccentric. So, and the isometric is when you're generating force, but you're not changing the length of the muscle. And this is kind of like, okay, it seems kind of abstract at first, so I like to use real life examples. And yeah, this is the martini version and this is more like I think 200 300 level. It's kind of of abstract and it's kind of hard to demonstrate. I mean, it's, here we have isolated muscles and these weights and putting them on ledges and whatnot. So I think this way. This is where open stacks I think does it better. So here we have I assume it's the biceps over here, biceps brachii. And here's a concentric contraction. So what happens when you do a dumbbell curl? You're contracting your biceps, you're using the muscle, you're activating, releasing calcium into your cytoplasm, you're having actin and myosin bind and shorten and shortening those sarcomeres. So this is a concentric contraction because you're generating force, but this overall length of the muscle is shortening. Now, say you're lowering that weight very slowly so this is what we call an eccentric contraction. So it's like compared to, not, you're not just saying your arms go limp, but say you're trying to maybe lower that dumbbell from its original contract, concentric, concentric contraction and lower it slowly with maybe like a three to five second count. So this is an eccentric contraction because if you're using this muscle, because it's actually lengthening as it goes from that concentric when it was like fully flexed, and as it's extending, but you're still contracting this muscle and engaging this muscle, this is what we call an eccentric contraction. But what if you're just holding that, mu that dumbbell out and just trying to maintain that position? Well, the thing is that you probably are still using your biceps, you're still using your muscles, but since there's no change in position, there's no change in length. If there's no change in length, does that mean you're not using the muscle? Well, try to hold a dumbbell like this for an infinite, infinite amount of time. You'll eventually find out, yes, you are using your muscles, even though you're not actually changing the length of the muscle. So this is what we call isometric contraction because you're not changing the length. So concentric, that means you're concentrate, doing the concentric contraction. Like, and this is what we typically think with contraction. But eccentric, this is kind of like where you kind of think, okay, oh, I'm lengthening, but at the same time, I'm engaging that muscle. Yeah, so concentric and eccentric. So I think that concentration curls, when you're doing concentration curl, when you're going from here to here, you're using concentric contraction of your biceps. Now, eccentric contraction, I like to use this one. Like, if you're doing a bench press, are you, I mean, if you, are you just going to let the weight go and just have it crash down on your chest? Probably not unless you want to keep you want to break your sternum or a few ribs So what are you typically engaging is that you're trying to let it go undo that Especially if you're engaging your pec major You're lengthening things and you're trying to slow that What that descent of the bar right but as you're descending that's actually lengthening your pectoral muscle You're still contracting it 
trying to keep it engaged so this bar doesn't come crashing down on you. But this is an eccentric. So when you think of this like opposite movement, eccentric contractions generally undo concentric contractions. Now isometric contractions, easy thing, this is probably one of the easiest ones. Like here we have someone doing a plank, or if you're thinking of yoga pose where you don't move at all. So when you're doing this or doing a yoga pose, are you engaging your muscles? Yeah, so even though you're not actually moving to the naked eye, what's happening here is like, as if you hold position, you're engaging all the muscles that helped you to maintain that posture and position. So even though you're not actually doing a joint movement, you're still engaging those muscles, the muscles are still contracting so that you can maintain that position. And maintaining the lengthening of that muscle keeps you in that position. And now let's talk about motor units. So motor unit recruitment, so remember that for skeletal muscle to contract, you need that brains. You need the motor neuron, which are the brains of the operation, and you need the brawn, which are the one or more muscle fibers controlled by a motor neuron. So if you engage fewer motor units, you have less force and more control. So say you only fire off maybe this blue neuron, you're only going to have these, what, seven, hopefully my color deficiency isn't getting me, seven motor fibers. But if you're have, engaging all of these motor neurons, this purple, blue, and red one right here, you're going to engage all this, what, 10, 15, 20 fibers right here. So you're going to generate seven or you're going to generate 20 fibers generating at once. So think of it this way. Which is going to which can do more heavy lifting? Seven people lifting a object at once, or twenty people lifting an object at once? So it depends. Like the more force you want, the more fibers you want to engage, and therefore more motor neurons. But if you have more neur, yeah. So this is what I'm getting at here. So think of it this way: you can have the same movement, and here we have Superman, and he's holding on to Lois Lane, and here we have Superman, and he's holding on to someone else. Now. He's kind of holding on to them, he's kind of wrapping his arm around them, but is he using the same amount of force? He might be using the same muscles, but can you imagine if he put Lois in the same chokehold that we had here? So he's maintaining good control of his motor units, or think of it this way, like, um, what's the difference between like a punch you do to your buddy, like, ah, stop it, like, you just do a quick punch like that, versus a full, like, you knockout punch. So the thing is that same movement, but the amount of force depends on the amount of motor units you're recruiting. Or say you're tossing your, like your nephew or niece or your baby in the air or your, your kid in the air. Are you going to toss them up like this? Or are you going to toss them up like you're doing a wall ball throw? So again, it can be the same movement, but the amount of motor units you use and engage in that same movement, that generate, determines the amount of force. So the thing is that with more force, less force, you have more control versus more motor units, yeah, more force. So you don't want to use too much force for the wrong purpose. So you are able to adjust and to determine how much motor units you're using for uh, this particular mo movement. And here we have, yes, yeah, so the cool thing about the motor units, say you want to maintain something like you're doing an isometric exercise and you're doing a yoga pose, do you want to like like when you do that pose, like yank up your all your muscles and all your joints in that pose, like you're doing a full, uh, like a full deadlift or clean and jerk. Probably not. But the thing is that how do you maintain? What prevents you from? What allows you to maintain a pose and prevents you from just collapsing immediately from that pose? Well, the things so that your motor units they can kind of take turns. So as this motor unit in the same muscle. Uh, you can have one motor unit engaging and the others relaxing and they can kind of trade off. They kind of have like shifts so that you're able to maintain tension and force but you don't have all your motor units firing off and tiring out at the same time. And lastly let's talk about slow and fast twitch. Now here we have two types of running. So here we have, there's actually, there's so many running sports at the Olympics, right? And just like in athletics in general. So here we have a bunch of them at the, the marathon during the Tokyo Olympics. And here we have the 100 meters men's final. Now, what do you notice about these, these people? Well, they're all doing running of some sort, but marathon, they're going over 26 miles versus here where we have 100 meters. 
And if you look at the people who win and the medalists in the, in the 100 meters versus the marathon, again, they're all running, they're using the same muscles, but look at how they're built. So here's the, I think he also won in Rio too, but here we have the winner of the Tokyo Marathon. And look at him, he's not much fat and he's pretty lean and sinewy. And here we have the winner of the 100 meters. And most like, look at, or actually look at the guys in the field of the 100 meters compared to the built, especially in the arms and the legs. Who's generally bigger, sprinters or marathoners? And you know, so like sprinters, they tend to be built bigger in terms of, and have more, have more muscle volume than the the um, marathoners, right? Or the previous go, like I think he retired before Tokyo. But if you ever seen like Usain Bolt, I mean, he's super lean. But when you see him like lift up his shirt, I mean, he's freaking stacked, right? So he's super built compared to a typical marathoner. So this is why that. And if you look at, so there's a lot of studies and slow versus fast twitch, they have different, if they look at a muscle biopsy and sample and histological sample of a skeletal muscle of a marathoner versus a sprinter, you notice that they're pretty different, right? So this is where it comes down to, like the proportion of slow versus fast twitch muscle fibers. So slow twitch and fast twitch, okay, contraction speed makes sense. And do you need to be super fast during a marathon. No, you need to outlast everyone. You want to be fast, but you don't want to burn through all your energy reserves as well. And this is also why people with more fast twitch fibers, they tend to have bigger muscles because the diameter, even though they're one cell each, the fiber diameter for slow twitch fibers, if someone has an overall bigger proportion of slow twitch fibers, they're going to have less voluminous muscles compared to someone who has a lot of fast twitch fibers like Usain Bolt. Now, the thing with the slow twitch fibers, they use more oxygen. So they have many mitochondria because mitochondria, again, the powerhouse of the cell. But mitochondria also need a lot of oxygen to generate the ATP that they generate. And they also have something called myoglobin, which is kind of like hemoglobin, but it's the hemoglobin of your muscle cells. And this myoglobin actually has a red color. This is why slow twitch fibers look darker red. And the thing with this mitochondria, they're actually able to use a, a wider variety of nutrients. So they not only can use carbohydrates, but they can also burn lipids and proteins as well. Now fast twitch fibers, even though they're bigger and they're faster, they burn out faster as well. So they use energy quicker and they're also more restricted in their amount of energy as well. So this is why the, the, it, it would be interesting if we saw a sprinter like Usain Bolt try to run a marathon and see how long he lasts compared to the professional marathoners. And how this bit, what it boils down to is muscle metabolism. So if you've taken supplements like creatine, like creatine is naturally produced by your body. And this is why if you want to create, load up your skeletal muscles with creatine, how does it work? Well, the thing about ATP itself, by itself, you just put ATP in a test tube, it's not very stable. And due to its energy containing properties, it doesn't really stay very stable in the cell for long. So creatine actually allows you to take that energy from ATP and store it for later. So creatine phosphate is more stable than ATP. The great thing is that when your cells or muscles are burning through a lot of creatine, they can actually use this built up creatine phosphate reserves, convert it back into ATP so you can have ATP to fuel whatever your cells metabolic needs are. Now there are two, those flat, fast and slow twitch fibers, so more specifically, and this is in the open stacks, I don't think Martini actually went too much in detail, or unless maybe in the old edition it didn't. We have the flat, when we talk about fast twitch fibers, I'm talking about these fast glycolytic fibers. So what we have, why are they called glycolytic? Well, they use this glycolysis to burn through carbohydrates. So again, notice that it's just carbohydrates and glucose, it's not any lipids or proteins. And what the other thing about glycolysis, it doesn't require oxygen. So this is why they're able to generate some ATP through this process of burning carbs and cook glucose and generating ATP. Now with the slow oxidative or the slow twitch fibers, well, they're oxidative because they have a lot of mitochondria and the mitochondria needs oxygen. 
And notice that you can have glucose, you can have fatty acids, it doesn't have the other parts with the Krebs cycle where you're actually able to use some amino acids for energy. But in general, for the same amount of glucose, oxidative phosphorylation is going to generate a lot more ATP. So it's not coincidental they put all these stars here to generate much more uh, ATP per the same amount of nutrients. And you can also use a wider variety of nutrients as well in slow oxidative fibers. And the, there's something called, some, also commonly called intermediate fibers, where they kind of take the best of both worlds. So they have the fast glycolytic and slow oxidative. And some people are like, oh, I tend to have like the slow, slow oxidative genes and does that mean I can't be a bodybuilder? Maybe you won't be Mr. or Ms. Olympia, but the thing is that a lot of, we have intermediate fibers and they kind of get the best of both worlds. What I mean by that? Well, by default, they rely on oxidative pho phosphorylation and metabolism, but they can switch to this. So they're kind of like, they, like a hybrid vehicle. They can switch between, like a hybrid vehicle switches between gas and electric. Same with these fast oxidative, these intermediate fibers. They can switch between this generating more ATP or becoming faster twitch and not using oxygen and just doing glycolysis. Again, this is faster, but it's less efficient, but this is slower, but you generate more energy. So we all have this, so don't give up hope. Don't think like, oh, I'm a marathoner. I'm an endurance sport person. I can't, I want to get super jacked. I mean. You can still do it, you just have to train a little differently. And why is the are the fibers different? So myoglobin. So myoglobin stores oxygen. It's not the same as hemoglobin, but they both store oxygen. And myoglobin is a red pigment itself. So this is why slow oxidative fibers, these slow twitch fibers tend to be redder because they have more of this myoglobin. And why do they need myoglobin? Well, if they have a lot of mitochondria and they consume a lot of oxygen, it makes sense to have a way of storing that oxygen. So myoglobin is kind of like your oxygen storage of the cell, muscle cells itself. Okay, so I think of it this way. Here we have a very, think of it this way, like a, or like here we have two types of muscle and here we have a big tuna that's kind of, think of a tuna, actually tunas are pretty powerful, but Think of it like slowly moving through this big fish lumbering through the ocean and then we have this snappy, this very quick moving hamachi over here. So white twitch versus and uh, white fast glycolytic versus slow oxidative and red. Actually there might be some carbon monoxide, it's too red. But again, so it's like slow versus fast twitch fiber, differences in the amount of myoglobin and this is why you have this like red meat versus dark meat. This kind of like some slow twitch muscle fibers tend to be redder and fast twitch tend to be lighter due to the differences in myoglobin. And that's all I have for today. So now you learned a lot about sarcomeres and how your, your muscles appear on the molecular level. But as you see that the molecular level affects the amount of tension, the twitch, and the type of metabolism you're able to do. So, yep. All right, so I know I went a little over time today. Thank you for dealing with uh, my mouse drawing. I'm going to try my find my pencil in my office again. <laughs> but okay, so see you all on Wednesday. And again, study guide will be out by this Friday. And thank you for to the moderators for helping out today. And see you on Wednesday.